Good evening. Uh, my name is Barnett Overett. I chair the Town of Foxborough Zoning Board of Appeals. And I am calling to order the January 20, 2022 public meeting of the board, including the public hearings that the board will conduct this evening. We're conducting this me meeting in a hybrid manner. Uh, Kim Mellon, Kurt Yegian, and I are participating remotely. Lorraine Brew and our administrative assistant, Diana Gray, are live and in person at Town Hall. Public comments this evening will be accepted during the public hearing. For anyone who wishes to offer comments by Zoom, you'll be asked to use the button in Zoom that is labeled raise hand. And this will alert you, will alert us that you wish to speak. And we will individually bring you into the meeting. In the event of any technical problems, the meeting will be paused until such issues are resolved. If the technical problems cannot be resolved in a timely manner, the meeting will be adjourned. The matters on our agenda that have not been considered will be continued to the board's next meeting. And that meeting currently is scheduled for February 18, 2022. And because three of us are participating remotely, all votes that we take tonight will be done by roll call. The time being 7 o'clock p.m., Scott Martiniak and Callbrook Construction seek a variance pursuant to the Code of the Town of Foxborough, Chapter 275, Section 4.1, Table 4-1, to allow a front yard setback of 30 feet where 35 feet is required for the construction of a front porch on a new single-family dwelling. The property is located at 16 Garrett Spillane Road, Assessor's Map 12, Parcel 49, Scott. in the R40 Scott. Residential and Agricultural Zoning Sit District, so and is not located in any restrictive overlay districts. Is Mr. Martiniak there? Yes. Hi, yes, Scott Martiniak, owner applicant. Scott, why don't you just give us a little background information as to what you're planning and telling us why you believe a variance is authorized. Okay. Um, so to give a brief history here, if we look at the first plan, uh, bottom right zoning board of appeals plan. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at lot 48A on that plan. A couple of things, The if you look below the lot on the adjacent lot, there's a labeled at the top certified vernal pool, isolated land subject to flooding. Um, just so a note history of this, when I purchased this parcel, um, started development, road construction was going on, this certified vernal pool was a isolated land subject to flooding for those not familiar with conservation rules regulations um, an isolated land subject to flooding the only protection that it has is the actual border of the that land there is no buffer zone um, so going into this project my lot was a hundred percent upland so with the view of there were basically no restrictions other than zoning restrictions. If you look at the date, the Vernal Pool was finally certified on 1-7-2021, which happened midway through my process. So, of course, that threw a large wrench in my plans here. Um, so on that same plan, there is, if you start far left corner, there's a dotted black line there um, and if you follow that through goes behind proposed house works its way over all the way almost to the right hand far right hand corner of the lot that is the buffer zone so when a vernal pool is certified in the town of foxborough this is beyond a state regulation this is strictly a town regulation there is a hundred foot no disturb zone from the edge of the vernal pool um, and basically, again, that's what that dotted line represents is that no disturbed zone. When I started the process, once this happened, again, kind of caught midstream, okay, we got to go to plan B here. Um, 
I went in front of the Conservation Commission several times, fought really, really hard to get some relief from that 100-foot buffer zone so it would give us a little bit of room to construct the home. The, um, I basically got nowhere with the Conservation Commission, so we started to regroup to try to sort this out. So if we go to the next plan, plan of land, Foxborough, Mass, Garrett, Spillane Road, um, you can see once again we have 49A, 48A. If you look at there's a dashed line, original property line, and then there's mm -hmm. a darker bold line that is the newly created property line. Um, so we came up with the idea is let's alter this property line to allow us to push the house to the left, which would be further away from the no disturbed buffer zone from the uh, vernal pool. We weren't able to move that line any further because of restrictions from existing or proposed structure, septic system, sideline setback. So we pushed it over as far as we can. Um, just to backpedal a little bit, a brief history for anyone who's not familiar with Garrett Spillane Road. So Garrett Spillane Road was formerly Camp Road, which was a way in existence, which went from North Street to Beach Street on paper. Um, the name was changed because Edwards Road essentially kind of cuts off Camp Road. And for emergency access, um, the fire department asked that we rename the road so there wasn't confusion over Camp 1, Camp 2. So the lots were all lots in existence also. Um, most of them conform, a couple were pre-existing non-conforming. So that's why the lots are kind of very odd shape because they were already existing. Um, so I think that covers that. Now, I was in the process, so I'm builder developer down there, and I was in the process of working with a customer before Vernal Pool was certified. Um, had a plan in place, had a site plan in place, and obviously we had to change course. So we've been altering lot lines, grades, reperking, because now we have to move a septic system because of the um, certified vernal pool in the buffer zone. Made some alterations to the house plan to try to make it work within the envelope that we had. Did a really good job. Um, a fell short of, okay, we have everything except customer really wanted to put a farmer's porch on the front of the house. And we couldn't make the housework and then put the farmer's porch and say 35 feet off of the um, required frontage. So as a note, once again, because this is a newly, now a newly constructed road, constructed under subdivision bylaws, the 35 feet is from the road taking, we're actually would be 45 feet from pavement, or I'm proposing that we are 40 feet from pavement. Um, the something else that may be of interest is the house to the right of it facing it is I believe don't hold me to this but I think is approximately 37 feet off of the road so at 30 feet it would still fit in character with what else is going on down there um, the same thing the adjacent house is affected by a neighbor in Vernal Pool, which was certified, which also has a 100-foot no disturb zone, so that was pushed forward to allow for some backyard on that property. Um, again, as you can see on the plan, I am now on the actual house plan. Um, you know, we were able to keep the entire main structure of the house, the 35 feet off. Actually, I think we're 36 feet off to give us a little bit of buffer. Um, but once again, just trying to do that porch. If we make the porch the 35 feet, it pushes us too close to the corner over in here. Um, you know, when the Conservation Commission says that that's a no disturb area, they literally mean don't touch that area. So mm -hmm. it would not allow me to have any room whatsoever to perform any kind of work if we put the corner of the house, the corner foundation right on the line. And essentially, by moving it to if to get the porch 35 feet, we would be right on the line. 
when you say right on the line, which? That 100 which foot no disturb zone for the vernal oh, okay. pool. Okay. Um, let, let me just ask you a couple of questions before I do that. Let me also explain. Um, th there are four board members here tonight, you know, three remote, as I indicated, and, and one who is uh, with you in, in town hall. Um, only three of us vote, and Kim Mellon and I are regular members, so we vote. Um, the other regular member is not here tonight, so I'm going to appoint Kurt to vote on this particular matter. Um, Lorraine is also able to participate in the discussion and ask questions, but only Kim, Kurt, and I will be the individuals voting. And in order to approve the variance, our decision must be unanimous, all three of three of us have to vote in favor of the uh, variance. So, so let me just ask you a couple of questions that come to mind. When I came down Garrett's Lane Road earlier today, um, this would be, that th there's a, a house that's under construction right now. Yes. And then there's a foundation across the, across the street on the other side. Yes. Now, we, which which ha which lot would this be? Would this be after the house that's under construction? Yes. Yeah, so right after the house under construction, um, I don't know if you took note. There was one of my trailers was sitting there. Basically, the house would sit right behind that trailer. Okay. So uh, is it what lot forty nine A that's under construction? Is that yes? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um. My understanding, and we checked this, or I wish I had Diana uh, check this earlier, is you, you haven't received any any building permits yet, correct? Uh, correct. Okay. Um, now, you mentioned you've been working with a customer. Do you have a signed agreement with that, with that party? Um, I do not have a signed agreement other than a contingent type of agreement. Um, mostly because we're just trying to resolve all of the issues mm -hmm. again at first we spent about six months trying to get through conservation so I didn't feel comfortable signing anything until we knew what the um, outcome was going to be with that and basically it's kind of left that based on hinged on what happens tonight so there's no hypotheticals involved in it mm -hmm. So are you indicating that if we would not be granting the variance, would, would that customer no longer be interested in the house? Um, that I am not sure. That would be up to them. Um, we okay. really haven't discussed that. Mm -hmm. And is there a significant price differential as far as what you would uh, you know, require to be paid for the house? without the porch versus with the porch? Um, I would say not really. Probably pretty okay. much just the value of the porch itself. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let me let Kim, Kurt, and Lorraine ask any questions they may have. Um, Barney, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, well, actually, first, I just want to ask um, for some clarification. So in looking at the application that you sent to us, it does indicate parcel 49, but then in looking at the plan, one of the plans, the one that says Zoning Board of Appeals, it actually appears as 48A. So I just want to ask for some clarification on that because we need to make sure that our decision reflects the correct parcel. Um, yes, I would say that that was probably my error. The um, 48A, I'm, I'm sure, you know, all of this stuff was done by Bay Colony, so I certainly trust their, <laughs> their okay. labeling the lots better than mine. The... Um, and I believe that that's right because I was always kind of confused by that because it was further down the road. You would always think that it would be opposite of that, that 48 would come before 49. I think that that was just my error in, on the application. Okay, so we're actually... They're looking at 48A, yes. 48A, okay. Yes. Sorry about that. 
Okay, no, no, I just, it's important that we have the right number down there. So that, thank you for the clarification. And so if I'm understanding you correctly, if the porch was subtracted from the plans, then this plan would meet the setback requirements. Yes. Okay, that's, that's all I have for the moment. Uh, Kurt, any questions? You're on mute, Kurt. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, just a couple of questions. Though. So, how long have you have you owned the lot that's there now, the 48A? Um, trying to think. Probably purchased it somewhere in June of 2000. If that was 21, that would have been 20, 2020. Okay. It's been a process of, I've actually been working on this project for 18 years. And because oh, okay. of all of the lots, as I mentioned earlier, were existing lots, they were all different owners. One of which was the town of Foxborough at one point. Um, so it was putting the pieces together, that being the very last piece of the puzzle that I had to put together. I see. And the other question is, and in, in, in just so, so I understand, I'm trying to put the whole thing together in my head. When there was a certified vernal pond created there, what 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 was that process? What how does that uh, so how, the you in, 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 basically the, the anyone, town come out or uh, how does that whole thing happen? Okay. I'm sorry I talked over you. Um, basically anyone can file to certify a vernal pool. Um, there's some documentation required. Um, they have to prove a vernal pool um, species is in the isolated land subject to flooding. Um, some other miscellaneous information that goes in front of the National Heritage <clears throat> and the National Heritage determines yay or nay, it's a certified vernal pool. Um, and just a little bit on the, you know, I'm not a wetland specialist by any means, but the Mass DEP regulations for certified vernal pool requires only the vernal pool be protected. There is no buffer on the state regulations. The 100 foot no disturb is purely just a town of Foxborough bylaw. Um, okay. was voted yeah, I was just on. trying to get more of like a timeline, like how, wh when did it happen? that when you purchased the property, did that trigger something that caused the vernal pool to be certified? Or yes. what was the timeline yes. of those two things happening? Yes, that you pretty much summed it up. That was, um, <laughs> if you will, maybe an attempt to prevent development, the certification of the vernal pool. So let me, let me inter <laughs> intervene, so, so who, started the process as far as the certification um the town conservation agent okay and at the time sure, one, sorry, one of the other members no, that, that's all that's all i had i was just trying to get that like the series of events what happened there that that's all i have for right now uh lorraine I don't have any questions, Barney. Okay. Um, I, I thought I had one, but I can't remember it. Um, <clears throat> I, I, actually, I think I know the answer, but let me, let, let me ask it anyhow. Um, the, 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 the plan that's entitled Zoning Board of Appeals Plan shows that you have a side yard setback of 17 feet. We require 15 feet. If, if you were to move the house to 15 feet, if you were to, in other words, you know, lay your foundation on, on, on the side next to lot 49A at 15 feet, would you be able to move the house a little bit back towards um, the term area so, and still not disturb it and, and still be able to put a porch in without needing a front yard setback? I think that we played with that and what happens is the the front line if you see um so 
that line comes to a point, and the reason for that is because frontage required for 49A. That's mm -hmm. why we have the point there. Um, and I think as we moved it over, we started to have an issue coming into the front of it. Okay. So in other words, it, it, there's no way to move the house. In, yeah, in we, tr we, again, this has been being worked on for almost a year and, and we've backed and flipped and tossed and turned and everything we mm -hmm. possibly could to, to make this work. Yeah. Okay. Now, now you've constructed some of the other homes on, on Garrett's Lane Road, correct? Uh, yeah, most of them. There was okay. one existing uh, that I didn't construct, and there was one that was built by another builder. The rest of them I constructed. Okay, and that wasn't in, in accordance with a subdivision plan? Um, so the road has been built under subdivision bylaws, but nothing. We followed the way in existence and pretty much stayed with lot lines that were existing. We didn't reconfigure this like a typical subdivision would have been done. Okay. Some lines have been moved over the years for various reasons. Right. And in, in sort of in relation to the last couple of questions, um, again, when I drove through the neighborhood this morning, or this afternoon rather, um, the, the houses are all different. It's, it's not as if you're, you're putting up you know, the same house in accordance with what you might typically see in a subdivision. Right. And my recollection is that there's only one other house that really has a front yard porch. Would that be correct? Um, existing, now the, actually, if you look at what is now proposed, they're all gonna, the new ones are all gonna have front yard porches, or proposed front yard porches. Um, so the last house that's completed on the left-hand side has a porch in the front. Skipper right. house in between has a porch in the front. Um, so yeah, there are porches on some of the other houses. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions that anybody, questions anyone may have? No. So Scott, the, um, Criteria for a variance. Let me let me read it. You know specifically, um, owing to circumstances relating to soil conditions, shape, or topography of land and structures, and especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in, in which it is, it is located, is criteria number one. Criteria number two: a literal enforcement of the provisions of the bylaw would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the, to the applicant. And three, desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the bylaw. So, so those are the requirements for a variance. And, and an applicant, in order to obtain favorable decision relative to the request must satisfy each of the, each each one of those um, those three requirements um, you know clearly this is a an art shape lot and clearly you've got um, I, I guess you would say topography because of the vernal pool and the, and the no disturbed zone um, you, you, meet, you meet that requirement. And, and I don't have any problem with if we were to grant this in saying that there's no substantial detriment to the public good and we're not going to nullify or, or abrogate or substantially derogate from the intent and purposes of the bylaw. So the, the real issue is, is the hardship issue. Um, and unless, you know, Kurt or Lorraine or um, Kim disagree, I, I think that's really the only issue that we need to to be comfortable with in order to determine whether to, um, to to grant the request so what what is the hardship um <laughs> and again it's, it's substantial hardship according to the um 
right to, in well, state that through the zoning bylaw. In in my eyes, the hardship was the certification of the vernal pool in the hundred foot buffer zone, um, mm-hmm. and you know we've made a very strong attempt by recreating lot lines and and doing whatever we possibly could and once again fighting very hard with the conservation commission um to try to get relief so we could do what we were trying to do here i mean you can see if you look at the lot in the little area tucked over in the corner where the house is and once again view this this is a hundred percent uplands there is zero wetlands on this lot whatsoever so we Mm -hmm. we've tucked it into the corner um so already it's created a hardship for you know myself essentially in terms of value um because of that and for future homeowner because they are now so restricted they have this little over an acre of land and they can only use a little small section of it i take that back they can use this area but they can never disturb it in any manner mm-hmm So, Scott, you think that determination of the vernal pool reduced the value? Um, it absolutely reduced the value, significantly. And are there any concerns from the, uh, from the neighbors about doing this? Have, have they raised objections at all? Um, nobody has. Nobody's present to object to it. Um, I, and I don't see why they would. Again, it's if we were going in there and, you know, every other house in the neighborhood was set back 75, 80 feet or something like that, and this one was going to be close. Um, but that is not the case. Probably the furthest setback would be the one when you drove through the neighborhood where the existing foundation is in there. And that, again, was something based on the septic system and the configuration of the lot um, lines. And especially this here, just because it's kind of on the cul-de-sac anyway, I don't even think that visually it's going to give an appearance that it's any closer than any other house. Because it's like if we take the porch area for an example, that's starting the radius of the cul-de-sac. So if you wanted to technically measure to pavement, it'll be further away to the edge of pavement than probably the other homes are. But the... The road taken goes straight, obviously. The cul-de-sac kind of bubbles off to the left a little. I mean, going again towards the issue of, of hardship, you know, I, I you know, I do agree that the shape of the property and the and the existence of the vernal pool has obviously impacted where you can place the house, but you can construct the house and still comply with you know the applicable dimensional requirements so the hardship has to relate to the to, to what you're looking for which is a variance to allow the porch to be constructed so let me um let me ask my colleagues what what, what do you see here in in that vein well if i could ask another question that you may yep. have start oh, i'm sorry let me do this here. Um, am I on? Yeah. Yeah, give it on. Okay. Um, you mentioned you don't have a contract in force with the potential buyer. Are they looking at other properties? Is it, is it likely that this could be something that would um, not want to have them move to the to the area or to the community? Um, I, possibly. I can't say that you know definitely what the situation would be um they have been sticking with me through a a lot of if you will hard times um originally this house was very nicely situated looking up the the road walkout basement you know really nice lot nice and private end of the cul-de-sac there's all woods back here um it was very desirable at that point i thought that I was going to lose them as a customer when the the certified vernal pool um, issue came in and I've been you know working at hard if you will and trying to why I'm here tonight I'm trying to give them as close to what they 
would desire as I possibly can. And the plan has been altered. The plan was different originally, so we went back to the drawing board with the architect to try to make it fit in there better than it, and, you know, as best we possibly could. As you see, if you look at it, you know, I'm looking at the plan facing the road right now, the right-hand side, you know, the, the structure was jogged in to accommodate for that area where the 100 foot starts to drift closer to the house. Um, and as you look at, so another situation that comes into play, which is somewhat of a hardship, the, we have a situation, the driveway is a funny shape because we have to enter into the property over the property. We can't enter into the property from another person's property. So because of that little point that comes to the um, lot line and we're as close to what we are as we're in the 10-foot um, road taken. So it's not 100% on its own property, but it's within the 10-foot road taken. The, the plans that you provided us uh, relative to the, um, to the house, um, did the initial plans include a, um, a farmer's porch? Was the initial that plans that, uh, did, yes. In fact, did. it was a okay. it was a larger farmer's porch on the original plan, um, and it had a, a what would be a more conventional deck um, in the rear of the house. The, basically, the deck now that you see is just a little more than a platform to allow to get access down to the backyard because there's no area to, to put a deck and stay outside of the the 100 foot 100 yeah 100 foot buffer zone okay um is, we can't I, tweak, I we want, tried can we it. tweak it a little bit we then what happens is you know corner gets too close to the we lose our 35 feet again mm-hmm Barney Yes. Uh, yes. So I just wanted to mention, you know, so the idea of having, you know, the hardship in terms of the value of this property that was created by the certification of the vernal pool, building the porch adds whatever dollar value to what could be possibly regained from what was lost. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if that supports a hardship aspect well i believe that um, the applicant said earlier that there really is no financial loss with the porch not being there the only financial difference would be the the cost of the porch is i believe what the applicant had said earlier yeah, that's that, that that's my recollection as well, and actually what I wrote down as far as my notes. Um, I, I think what I want to do is this: is, is is there anybody at town hall who would wish to speak on this? No, there's no member of the public. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody who is on Zoom who wishes to speak? So why don't what we do is close the quote unquote public portion of the hearing and then we can we we can discuss this. So even though there's nobody on the public there, why don't we why don't we close it? So Kim, would you make a motion? Yes, I move that we close the public portion of the meeting. Uh Kurt, you want to second it? And again, I've got to do this by roll call. So Kim? Yes. Kurt. And Barney, yes. So yes. let's uh let's Let's discuss. Um, again, you know, soil conditions, shape, topography, I think that requirement is met. And I'm not concerned about, you know, any detriment to the bylaw or anything of that nature. Um, but we, what we have to make a determination is to, is whether the soil condition, shape, or topography of the property um, cause a substantial hardship to the uh, to the applicant to, to what the applicant is desiring. So again, um, and, and I want to hear, you know, as much as possible from you know Kurt, Kim, and, and Lorraine on this. 
a house can be constructed on the premises and still meet the applicable dimensional requirements of the bylaw, both as far as the side yards and as far as the front yard. So really the question is whether by adding a five foot wide porch and, and therefore violating the setback requirement, whether there's a substantial hardship related to the porch itself and not to the house. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, hopefully that's clear. I'm not sure that it is, but, but I think that's really the issue. The issue has nothing to do with, with the house per se, because the house as proposed will comply with the um, dimensional requirements. It's the porch that would cause the house not to comply. So therefore what we have to determine is, is whether because of the topography, because of the soil conditions, because of the shape of the property, there would be substantial hardship to the applicant if we were to say that variances is, is not permissible, that we have to comply with the requirements of the bylaw, but it has to do with the porch because again, the house can be constructed. So let me leave it to whoever wants to go first. Give me your thoughts. Um, I'll go first. So it sounds like this has been a very long road, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and and as Barney said there, we are not talking about to build or to not build this house. The house can be built without coming before us at all. So we're just coming down to a porch. And what I keep circling back to in my head is what the applicant said closer to the beginning of this hearing that there is no financial loss if the porch is not built. The financial difference has to do with the materials for the porch. Now, if I'm remembering that incorrectly or I'm saying that incorrectly, I am happy to be corrected on that, happy to be corrected on that. So I keep coming back to that. So we're talking about a porch that is encroaching and I'm not sure if a porch, having a porch or not having a porch is a substantial hardship. But I do agree with Barney on the others. There certainly are some topography issues in here and, you know, adding a porch into a house in a, on a road is, is certainly not um, something that's going to be detrimental to the neighborhood, but I, I'm a little bit stuck on the hardship. Mm -hmm. uh, Kurt, you want to go next? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything Kim just said, frankly. Um, she put it very well. I understand that this is a long and complicated project and process, and it sounds like you've been very diligent and thoughtful with your client throughout the entire thing. So. It doesn't seem like there's any detriment to the neighborhood. It doesn't seem like um, there's any of those sort of negative factors that typically come up in something like this. Um, but again, it gets back to you know the the, the hardship nature of this, and um, you know the one thing I've learned being on the zoning board, it's not it's not really about us. It's it's sometimes not about a specific case, but about a precedent, right? And mm -hmm. If, if this happens and we allow it, then what's to stop the next person from saying, well, you allowed it to the applicant and, uh, you know, not to, not to me. And so that's what we just have to be really careful of. And I never really realized that until I started getting into more of these types of situations. And uh, it is about precedent. So mm -hmm. I stand. Uh, Lorraine? No, I think, you know, Kim, Kim hit the nail on the head recalling that language. So um, I think probably my, to me, the questionable part where there's no agreement here, you know, it's, it's a guess that there would be, you know, what is the potential for loss of this project if a porch isn't granted? Mm-hmm. You know. 
because we're close to I, do I can I say something or yeah go ahead um, so once again we're, we're on the, the financial hardship so from my perspective what would the financial hardship be now um, if we look at again the plan zoning board of appeals and if you envision this whole thing sliding back five feet we now have a situation if you see the stairs and the deck that's going to encroach into the hundred foot buffer zone so that's going to have to be changed um, mm -hmm. and or removed remove the porch so will there be a direct financial hardship from the porch itself as I stated earlier no I don't think that the house has stronger any more value and probably a little bit more value but nothing significant if the porch is there or not there but it would be a, a big hardship being this far into the process that if my customer said, you know what, I'm done. I don't get the porch now. I don't know how I'm going to get from, from floor one to floor two. We have to start the design process all over. They've been, again, going along for the ride for quite some time. So the hardship for the applicant would be is that if my potential customer decided that they just didn't want to pursue this any further. I mean, let, let me let me throw the question over to before I speak to Kim, Kurt, and Lorraine. Does that cause any difference in opinion? I think if there's nothing signed, I mean that, that, that mm -hmm. I appreciate what you're saying, and I understand that's of course the next question for you. But I'm not sure that as this board can deal with hypotheticals mm -hmm. like that. Okay, Kurt. Well, I, I thought I had asked earlier if that was going to prevent them from moving to the community. Yeah. I, I, I was being, I was meaning specifically the house. Mm -hmm. uh, Lorraine? No, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Um, not, not, not that I necessarily expected anything, you know, differently. Um, but, but I agree, you know, hundred percent with, um, you know, with what Kurt and, and Kim and, and Lorraine have, have stated, um, you know, obviously, you know, being an attorney, I, I, I guess, um, you know, for, 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 for good or bad being an attorney, um, you know, I do look at applications we have from, you know, from that perspective and, you know, it's clear from, you know, case law that variances should be seldomly, you know, given. And it, it, I think it's also clear that, you know, very frequently decisions turn on whether there is or is not, again, substantial hardship. And, you know, if this was a case of whether a house can be constructed on the property, um, I think I can make out a, an argument that there would be substantial hardship to uh, to Mr. Martiniak. But you can construct a house on the property. Um, I would hope that, you know, you would not lose this prospective, you know, customer. But if you do, that does not foreclose the house being sold to, to somebody else. So, unfortunately, I do not see... Um, you having complied with the requirement or having met the requirement in this particular instance of, um, of substantial hardship. So uh, unless there's something else to be said or asked, um, a motion from somebody. Uh, I move that we decline the application. Do we have a second? I second that. And again, I do by roll call. Uh, Kim? Uh, again, yes. A, a yes vote would be to, again, deny the application, to deny the request for a variance. Uh, yes. Uh, Kurt? Yes. And um, uh, me, yes. Um, Scott, let me say a, a couple of things. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, you know, I appreciate the... Um, well, I, actually, I appreciate the, the work. I think we all appreciate the work you've done with the Conservation Commission. 
we do. to um, to try to comply with um, with their requirements and still have a, a have a buildable lot. Um, I do appreciate, and I know I'm speaking on behalf of the board. Um, you know your your efforts tonight to um, you know to make your case. Um, I certainly hope that, notwithstanding our decision, your current potential customer buyer will will, will will stay the course and if not i'm certain i'm not, not shouldn't say i'm certain but i'm hopeful that you know in, in due course you would be able to find another buyer you know such that you can you know construct the house with, without a porch that obviously complies with the um with the zoning bylaw we will draft and sign a decision i'm going to hopefully be able to do that sometime next week after it is fully signed um, Diana will be filing it with the town clerk that kicks off a 20 day appeal period, which means that you have the right to appeal our decision. You know, the appeal would have to be to either the land court or the superior court, but you have that right and you would have to do it within the 20 day period after the decision is certified by the town clerk. Any questions? No, I'm good. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Okay, the time being 7.05 p.m. And a little bit after that, we have the continued public hearing of media partners, MRB LLC, requesting a special permit pursuant to the Code of the Town of Foxborough, Massachusetts, Chapter 213, signed Section 213-3C1A, Section 213-5A1, Table 1 permitted signs, and 213-6A1, Table 2, Dimensional, dimensional requirements billboards to allow the conversion of the two sides of an existing static billboard to an electronic billboard. Billboard is located on Washington Street, Assessor's Map 004-009, and is located in Sign District 1. As I indicated at the very first hearing, this is not for a special permit, but it's a special sign permit. And Frank, um, Lorraine will join Kim and I and vote on this particular matter. Whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Attorney Frank Splain here, representing Media Partners, MRV LLC, as the applicant. With me here this evening is uh, Peter McCleary, who is an owner and manager within Media Partners. Uh, initially, I'd like to thank the board for their tolerance and our continuances uh, for the last few months. Um, we've been attempting to get um, examples of exemptions uh, within the state for um, um, certain electronic billboards uh, within a certain distance of each other. We've been unable to get that, even though we've filed requests um, with them. Uh, so we're going to continue here this evening. However, we're going to only request uh, electronic um, billboard on one side. We're withdrawing our request for a north-facing billboard sign um, at this time, and we're just requesting for a self-facing electronic billboard at this time. And as I go through my presentation, uh, I'll explain further the reasons for, for why we've decided that. Um, and initially, we're doing that is because under the state uh, CMR, we're not requiring uh, an exemption for that. It's just allowed under the CMR. Uh, whereas, with regard to the um, north-facing uh, billboard, we would have needed an exemption, and those were the decisions we were trying to get copies of to provide the board. So, um, just to go over. Um, the property is located on Route 1, Washington Street. It has a, an address of 1414 Providence Highway. It's uh, the assessor's map 004, parcel 009, and is in the S1 zoning district. 
uh, we're requesting uh, from this board a special uh, sign permit in order to uh, convert the static billboard that's currently there to an electronic billboard um, for the south facing uh, static billboard. And we need um, the sign permits under section 213, 3C, 1, um, A and G, 213, 5A1, table one, and 213, 6A1, table two. Um, again, we're trying to request uh, to change Again, just the south facing billboard to electronic billboard. Also, we need a special permit uh, to allow electronic billboard uh, that's within 108 feet of another electronic billboard. I'd just like to clarify in my letter uh, to you, um, I indicated that it was uh, a distance of 881 feet away. It is actually 808 feet between uh, where the current static billboard is and where the electronic billboard is. That electronic billboard is located at the intersection of Route 1 and North Street uh, by the McDonald's there. And that was the first uh, billboard um, um, in Foxborough that was electronic. So under the bylaw, electronic billboards have to be 1,000 feet uh, apart we're requesting a sign, uh, special sign permit to allow us to be uh, 808 feet um, apart from the next closest one. Um, initially, we again, we have a existing two-sided static billboard there now. Uh, Metro Vision LLC um, uh, under case uh, 2019-15, which is dated January 2020, received a special sign permit to install the two-sided uh, static billboard, which uh, is uh, 672 square feet on each side. And then in January of 2021, a year ago, uh, the Board of Appeals approved the transfer of the special sign permit to Media Partners MRV LLC, who is the applicant at this time. The two-sided static billboard has been constructed and is um, ready for uh, to op for operation. Um, initially, uh, the first thing uh, we're requesting again is a special permit to convert one of the sides, and again that is the south facing side, uh, from a stack billboard to an electronic billboard. Um, the existing sign is um, again 14 by. 14 feet by 48 feet, 672 square feet in area, 50 feet in height. The uh, proposed electronic billboard is identical in size and dimension as the existing. It's going to be using the same structure, just changing over from a static to um, an electronic sign. All of those, the new billboard signs that are being built today uh, that are static are also being built to accommodate electronic billboards. Uh, again, it won't require any structural other changes to the existing billboard structure, again, except from converting from a static to electronic. Um, Section 213-3C2 sets forth the factors that have to be considered uh, for a special sign permit. Um, and those are Design first, there as follows. First, the design guidelines under section 213 7 have to be followed, and we'll get to those later. The second thing is the impact of the proposed sign uh, on the proposed bylaw, neighbors, neighboring property, and character of area. Um, uh, the sign bylaw was amended uh, by overwhelming vote in uh, the May 2019 town meeting. It reflected that the town favored. Uh, favorably the view of operating electronic billboards on Route 1. Uh, Route 1 is a commercial um, area. Uh, it's commercial nature. Uh, so there will be no impact uh, on the character of the area or any neighboring properties. Uh, the number of billboards uh, that are currently installed on Route 1 uh, are quite a few. Uh, there are two electronic currently. Uh, one, again, on McDonald's and one further down on one side. 
and there are more uh, billboards in, electronic billboards along Route 1 in neighboring towns. And the various uh, businesses on uh, Route 1 also have other types of electronic signs. They're smaller in size, but there are a number of those. So uh, the changeover to an electronic billboard um, will be in character with the area um, and will not be out of character with the area. The third item is location and visibility of the sign from public way or park. There are no parks in the general area. Uh, and the sign will uh, really only be visible from Route 1 where it's being located. Uh, the proposed signs proximity to existing signs. Again, um, uh, to the south there's a static billboard 787 feet away and there's an electronic billboard 808 feet away. Again, that electronic billboard is um, north facing. It does have a static billboard south facing. So it's two-sided, but there's only one electronic billboard on that one by McDonald's, and that is north-facing. So it really won't have any impact on, 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 on either of those. Uh, the fifth one is the proximity and visibility of the proposed sign uh, to residential uses. There's no residential area situated in the Route 1 um, area with a close proximity of the sign, and the sign will not adversely impact any residential use. The closest residence in Foxborough was over 1,000 feet away and in Walpole over 700 feet away. Item number six uh, is the nature and condition of other structures or land uses on the site. Uh, the current use of the property is for parking. There's no other business being run there. Uh, so the sign will have no impact on the current use of it. The parking still continues to go on there. Um, the property is limited to the uh, parking use because of the wetlands that are located on the southwesterly portion of the site. Um, and in the plan that um, I provided you, you can see uh, the wetlands, and then there's a 100-foot um, wetland uh, buffer zone. The existing sign was located, so it's outside of both the wetlands and the 100-foot uh, buffer zone. Um, and that's what the original static billboard was located there for that purpose. So that would not be located in the wetlands or in uh, the 100 foot buffer zone. Uh, because of the wetlands and, 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 the, and the different buffer zones, uh, the property really can't be developed uh, to its full extent as permitted under the uh, zoning bylaw. And um, that's why it's continued to be used just for parking and why this um, um, static billboard was initially constructed and why we want to convert at least at this time one side of the stack billboard to uh, electronic item number seven is the public safety issues or concerns uh, that the proposed sign might create or impact um, the change from a static to electronic on one side uh, that change will not create any additional traffic or other safety issues um, and it won't impact any of the um, current uh, existing conditions. Item number eight is the elimination of the proposed sign, the size, height, material, color. Again, the, the um, sign is there currently. It's not going to change except from going from static to electronic on one side, so there'll be no change in size, height, material, colors. The illumination will change from a, from a static, which is spotlights located uh, on the bottom, reflecting up to electronic, which has minimal spillover. Item number nine is the benefit to the town of uh, Fox, the town of Foxborough residents and general public. Uh, the town will um, benefit with additional taxes going from, from static to electronic and other revenues. And there's also mitigation payments um, that will have to be made uh, because of, under the bylaw mitigation agreement has to be um, agreed to with the um, uh, Board of Selectmen before any billboard can be constructed or converted from static to electronic. Uh, Foxborough businesses on Route 1 and elsewhere within the town will also benefit with additional advertising uh, mechanism that's located on Route 1. Instead of being static, it'll be electronic, so you can get additional um, um, advertising on that for the, for the town. Um, 
the board in granting its previous special permit in, in order to allow the um, static billboard um, uh, to be constructed and operated determined that we satisfied all of these at that time factors in order to be uh, provided that special sign permit and we feel that we're um, uh, meeting those requirements at this time also also under the bylaw there's additional prohibitions the billboard cannot be animated um, can't contain moving um, content or video and has to change over every 10 seconds and additional the state has uh, requirements with regard to construction and operation um, of electronic uh, billboards um, so that's the first part of the special permit we have to go to get allowance to change over from static um, to electronic the other part is the special permit to allow uh, an electronic billboard um, within 808 feet uh, from another electronic billboard where a thousand feet is required under uh, note 2 of section 213 6a1 table 2 uh, for sign district 1 um, uh, section 213 3c1g requires that the special sign permit to exceed dimensional requirements or reduce the thousand feet down to 808 feet um, uh, set forth in the bylaw but it must adhere to the sign um, design guidelines of section 213.7 which is also one of the ref uh, factors um, for this regular special uh, permit. Um, a special sign permit uh, can be authorized by the board by allowing the proposed electronic billboard to be within 100 feet, uh, mainly because of the physical features of the uh, subject property. Um, again, there are wetlands that are located on the southwest portion of the site. Could you bring up the um, plan? He can put it. Oh, okay. It's right there. So, uh, as you can see, to the um, uh, south and west, there's um, um, a great deal of uh, wetlands. But then you also have to there's a, a 25 no activity zone, which you can't do anything in. Then you have the 100 foot uh, wetland buffer, and because of that, the, the sign had to be placed out of those areas. And as you can see, as the as-built plan, um, the sign itself is outside, and each of the um, billboards themselves are outside, and the um, southbound facing uh, billboard gets very close to the 100-foot wetland buffer, but, but does not go over that. Um, and that's, and so that technically we could have placed uh, the billboard, um, we'll say 200 feet further down, uh, further south on the property, but it would have been located in the wetlands. Um, but because of the location of the wetlands, and we're not, we're not wanting to disturb them, even though you can replicate up to 500, uh, 5,000 square feet of disturbed wetlands, um, we wanted to be outside of that as well as the 100 foot wetland buffer. And that's what caused the current billboard to be located where it is which is causing it to be just over 800 feet from the other electronic billboard um, the board therefore can and is permitted to allow electronic billboard at the current position which is 808 feet from another electronic billboard due to the physical features of the property again the wetlands and the buffer as a large portion of the property um, outside of the it being only 808 feet from the other electronic billboard it will comply with all dimension and it does comply with all dimensional requirements of an electronic billboard as set forth in table 2 um, of the bylaw again the design guidelines under section 213-7 uh, uh, the first one states the sign shall be consolidated sign shall be consolidated and limited in number to the greatest extent possible to minimize ver visual clutter um, by converting the existing static billboard to an electronic one uh, we will not be increasing the number of signs it's the same number of signs um, so that factor is not um, involved here the second one states that the sign shall be constructed of high quality material and utilized 
energy efficient illumination. Um, it currently does, and the conversion of it will continue to use high quality material and energy efficient uh, illumination. The third design guideline was the sign shall not obscure architectural features and shall be constructed of substantial materials that are compatible with the materials of the service of which they are affixed. Again, this is a standing billboard on its own. Uh, there's no uh, structures uh, on the site, um, so uh, it doesn't obscure any architectural features and the construction uh, is of substantial materials. Um, number four is the colors and illumination of sign shall be uh, appropriate intensity to the use and location of the site and to the site's immediate abutters. Uh, the intensity is uh, minimal impact. Uh, again, the board uh, typically conditions that the police chief or the building commissioner, if they determine that there's any glare or lighting impairment to motorists or interference with any safety operations, that they can require that the intensity um, uh, be reduced. But these electronic billboards also change the intensity uh, with regard to the um, um, sunlight uh, that they're getting throughout the day. Um, the next item is signs and sign contact. Content should be appropriately sized, scaled, located, and oriented to the use and structure to which they are um, on a standalone. So this is a standalone billboard. It, again, it complies with all the dimensional requirements of the bylaw, except for the distance from the closest um, electronic billboard. And the last one has to do with uh, multi-tenant buildings, which is not uh, applicable here. So um, we feel that um, we meet all the requirements um, with regard to the town in order uh, to receive the special permit. Um, additionally, um, again, we're trying to get um, information from the state with regard to exceptions that um, they've allowed in the past um, this would not require an exception uh, from the state when it goes in front of them. It was only the um, north-facing one uh, that would require um, an exception um, because under uh, the 700 CMR um, uh, 3.17.5J, it states that subject to the approval of the department, Spacing between electronic signs may not apply where they are separated by a building or other obstruction with the geometry of the roadway is such that only one sign is visible from any point on the public way or at any one time. At any one time. And then um, additionally, it's, it states under uh, 700 CMR 3.176, uh, it states pretty much the same thing that subject to the approval of the department, the 1,000 foot spacing requirement between electronic signs may not apply where a proposed sign and existing sign are separated by building other permanent obstruction or the geometry of the roadway is such that the motorist can only view one sign at any one point on the public way at any one time. So again, the existing sign uh, up by McDonald's has only one electronic sign and that is north facing. On the other side, the south facing is a static. Uh, what we're requesting is that on our billboard, the north facing one will stay as static, but the south facing we would like to convert to electronic. That way, when any, um, um, anyone is driving either northbound or southbound on Route 1, they cannot see both um, electronic uh, billboards at the same time. And those sections I read to you um, um, are talking specifically about electronic signs shall not um, do certain things, but they're allowed to be less than a thousand feet if those conditions exist. And, and in this case, they do exist because again, at any one time, a motorist will not see both of them. And that's why um, we will not need an exemption from the state in order to, for this to be allowed. We withdrew the north facing billboard because that would have required an, an exemption. And we know of exemptions that exist for such billboards, but we haven't been able to 
um, um, provide them to you. I gave you a list of some of them that we were actually able to obtain from a competitor that had kept a, um, a list. But you'll notice that these are all 2016 or earlier. So you stop compiling them. We wanted to find the ones that were 2017 and, and, and later for your benefit. Since we couldn't get it and we wanted to proceed with it uh, this evening, we're withdrawing the request for the northbound facing uh, conversion and just asking for the south uh, facing billboard. Um, and again, under the 700 CMR, uh, Massachusetts Department of Transportation rules and regulations, uh, this will be allowed. And uh, we feel that uh, it, it can be allowed under um, our bylaws with a, the special permits in order to convert it and also a special permit to allow the 1,000 to be reduced from uh, 1,000 feet to 808 feet. And again, um, I want to clarify that the distance between the two are 808 feet. I put in the letter an error, a higher number, and I did go back to my original notes on the original application, and it was at 808 feet um, on that application. And if I could, I'd just like to ask Peter just to speak briefly about his attempts to um, get um, information that we thought would be helpful, uh, but also uh, the process which why um, he feels that we would be able to get the approval for the south uh, facing billboard and convert to electronic with the state. Peter? Um, um, thank you very much. Um, we have um, requested um, through the Freedom of Information Act um, in November and just recently all records for um, exemptions. There's a there's a, a section of the CMR that allows for the uh, Federal Highway Bureau, uh, which is located in, in Cambridge, and the Secretary of Transportation and the Director of Outdoor Advertising can um, give an exemption to just about anything except for federal law, which cannot you, which you cannot get an exemption from. An exemption is, in my opinion, it's kind of like a waiver. I mean, not a waiver, but I mean, it's a, 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 a variance. Um, but we haven't been able to get them to be able to provide the information to us. And I think it's merely due to COVID. Um, they're still working out of the office. I don't know what their access is to the records. And they're kept, especially, you know, once we move on you know, um, and once the decisions are made, I think they're probably archived at some point. We will get it at some point. Um, they're generally pretty decent. They're slow under normal, normal circumstances, so you, you can probably imagine what it's like trying to get information, you know, the last couple of years from them. Um, I think this, the, the, the whole, when we kept it out of the, the original uh, billboard, the static billboards out of the buffer zones and the wetlands areas, and um, you know, certainly we don't have you know a very big impact. I have been doing this for about 34 years. I've built signs in harbors. I've built signs in wetlands. I've built signs um, in swamp areas and small lakes and the edges. Because of the fact that we don't displace very much, um, the pole can go almost directly in the ground, and it's easy to mitigate um, in future wetlands. Mm. But if you didn't have to do that, you didn't have to go through that process, and it, it's a lot of work, and it's never a given, we decided to keep it out and you know, figure out at some later point you know, if we could do um, a digital transformation Right now, we don't have enough information to be able to give to the board um, regarding um, precedent cases um, on the, um, the state level and the federal level. Um, so we're sticking with the south-facing sign because I think in the spirit of, of, of the state's guidelines, they look at it and they said, okay, we want 1,000 feet between signs, but it's kind of unfair if we're going to um, you know, 
enforce that rule if you can't see the two signs at the same time and then they throw away the distance um, regulations on that um, and this is similar um, we've got a north facing sign that's about 300 square feet it's a smaller sign and, um, and at no time can you see um, either of the signs uh, at the same time as far as the digital faces of the signs um, the light trespass from static signs is far greater than than electronic billboards electronic billboards are LEDs their light is maintained um, the lights on a static billboard are quite a, frankly they're they're very similar to you know Gillette Stadium they light up everything um, so in this aspect it probably will be better even for for wetlands and things like that um, and uh, I've long made presentations to cities and towns. Um, that's the main function of, of this. The, I, the main function of my company, and my company is part of this 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 company MRV. Um, we often have been. I took over the New Jersey transit system and installed a whole bunch of new measures there to increase revenue for the towns and for the state uh, to the tune of about $300 million over the next 20 years, and that's probably about 10 years ago. Um, in this instance here, and I've long maintained that static billboards really don't do a lot, you know, for the community because, and they don't really do a lot, to tell you the truth, for the property owner in comparison to what a, a digital sign can do. The digital sign will provide so many hours of public service that's mandated by the state. It becomes part of the Amber Alert system. Um, it can become part of the public safety um, system in the town of Foxborough, meaning that the town, hall, police, fire, DPW, if there's some sort of weather-related event or catastrophe or public uh, safety, you know, they can immediately take over the sign just like the Amber Alert takes it over for 45 minutes and no flips go on. You have six to eight flips of advertising and in there you can incorporate far more economically um, based plans for smaller businesses. With a static sign you have one business and it's a Big Mac or it's a Budweiser or it's a car. Um, but if you rotate in other mechanisms you know, you rotate into other advertising messages, you can really make it beneficial to both the state and for the local community. Um, and there's also the, the financial benefit. I mean, there is no uh, remediation to the town for the static billboard. So it's not nearly as, 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 as attractive to either the landowner or um, the town. In, in my opinion as far as monetarily um, it's just a single sign that sits up there and changes every now and again so this is something that state has decided to think about can't see them both at the same time we can reduce it because their intent was to actually not have two visible digital signs at the same time at least in a general area I'm sure they have had exemptions to that, I, I know that, but um, in general, their case is, if you can't see them both at the same time, you know, as long as they're 500 feet apart, which we're well in excess of that to meet state regulations, they're not going to, you know, use that, that rule. Thank you. Uh, if I could just point one thing out, I'm not sure I uh, included this earlier. The existing electronic sign at 29 Washington Street down by McDonald's, um, each side is 279 square feet uh, because it was a pre-existing non-conforming sign from probably before zoning. Um, um, so it's a, it's a much smaller sign, less than half the size of um, all the other signs, which are 672 square feet along it. Um, so again, we're very comfortable that you won't be able to see both of those electronic signs at the same time. They're facing different directions, and also uh, the existing one is, is much smaller. Thank you. 
Can I say one last thing, please? Uh, go yeah, go ahead. Me. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, oh I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, and I think that, you know, given how towns, the Board of Selectmen, City Councilors, um, and then certainly Zoning Board of Appeals or special permitting authorities, you know, they um, are wary of um, precedent. Mm -hmm. But in this case, this property can't be used for really anything else because it's, it's, it's so inundated with wetlands and, and the buffer zones. Um, and given the fact that, that these set of circumstances where a board is facing in the opposite direction from you know our our proposed digital sign, I think it's an extremely unique situation that you probably won't find um, on any or very few other properties in dealing with this. It's, it's just it's very unique to me that we're so limited in where we could place it, and it's also not showing in the same direction as another sign. Well, let me um, open this to questions from the board members. <clears throat> Lorraine, do you want to start? Sure. Um, Frank, you had mentioned the ability to move. Did you mention earlier the ability to move the sign to w a different place within the wetlands? If we have the um, existing property is, is large enough that the, the sign could have been located 200 feet mm -hmm. south, south. Yeah. but it would have been located in the wetlands. Yep. So um, at the time of the initial um, uh, determination that they wanted to put the static there, they decided to keep it out of the wetlands for all those purposes. When we initially talked and I got the distances, I asked them if they were ever going to convert this because of the distances with um, um, that electronic billboard. And they said, we may at some point, and, and we'll deal with it at that time, but they didn't want to go forward with the static at that time. And they, but they didn't want to put it in the wetlands and out of the 100-foot buffer. But it could have been placed on the property 200 feet away, um, but it would have been in the wetlands. And it's the wetlands you know um then it would be that caused thousand. them to put it where it is because that's pretty much as far as they could have um put it so if they put it any more south then the um, um south facing billboard would have been hanging over the wetlands and we would have been in front of conservation so you know the physical features of the um property located the sign where it is Uh, Lorraine, anything else? I'm all set. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Kim, do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, I guess. Well, I guess a question, a comment. Maybe this is for. Maybe this is for later. Um, just looking at some of the wording, the reading of the 700 CMR 3.17J and also six. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I'm reading that a little bit differently, Frank, than what with that what you're saying. So what I'm reading is that the the spacing between the electronic signs may not apply where they are separated by a building or other obstruction, which is not the case here, or geometry of the roadway. So neither of those conditions appear, I mean, if you had some sort of a ruler, it may not be exactly, one may not be exactly straight at that point, but I don't believe the geometry of the road comes into play and they're certainly not separated visually by a building or any other obstruction. 
So I know that you're focusing a little more on the, the latter part of both J and six, which as you said, are very similar, that only one sign is visible from any point on the public way at one time. But I'm reading it as because they were separated or the geometry of the road. So I'm not sure if the rest of the board is reading it in, in you know, in that same way. Um, so I can, I can answer that. Okay. Well, excuse me. Um, I think that the obstruction in this case is a static billboard that's on the south facing sign itself of the current McDonald's billboard. Um, it's preventing you from seeing the, even the back of the digital sign. And I know the state's intent, I, I do know the state's intent is to make sure that you can't see two digital billboards at the same time. And the obstruction here, or the geography of the roadway would be that the people looking at these two signs are traveling in opposite directions. So, I mean, for the passengers that are coming towards Gillette Stadium, they could see the existing digital billboard and for the passengers leaving Gillette Stadium, they're seeing the proposed or would see the proposed digital billboard for us. So that could be very easily construed. And I think as, as being a geography uh, of the roadway and the fact that they're separated by a static sign, which is another obstruction, but even more, even more, I think, uh, I don't know what the word, uh, even more appropriate is when they go on in the next paragraph, the next section, and talk about two electronic signs not being visible at the same time, and that's exactly what this is. Yeah, under six, you know, it, it, it talks about the geometry of the roadway is such that the motorist can only view one sign at any one point on the public way. So, you know, in this case, we're saying, I agree with you, it's pretty much straight in that area you know it's, it's a little hilly and all that but that's not affecting this that they want to make sure you can't see two electronic signs at the same time if they're less than a thousand and if you can't then you don't have to be a thousand feet away and what was what we're stating is is the fact that um, the existing ones north facing and ours are south facing and again theirs is much smaller too uh, than a normal one that even though it's the geometry of the roadway, even though it's, it's straight, uh, that you can't see both of them at the same time, that it meets the uh, intent. And uh, from the very beginning, Peter explained to me that it, what it means is you can't see both of them at the same time, however it is, whether it's a sharp turn, you know, in the roadway, which would probably meet your description, or in, in this case, because you have, um, um, electronic billboards facing opposite directions and again one of them is much smaller than the other that you can't see both of them Kim when when I drove it I was looking and seeing that you know I could see both of those signs at the same time um, but you're differentiating by saying the electronic version or aspect will not be visible as I'm driving south that's right, because the existing sign has a static. Mm -hmm. We have to be more than 500 feet away from that. We meet that. The electronic, we have to be uh, 1,000 feet away. We're asking for a special permit to reduce that. So, um, and again, in the CMR, it's just discussing the electronic. You know, when you're going southbound, you can see the existing electronic, and you can see the existing static which is facing northbound but you can't see the south bell facing um, static billboard at this time that we want to do electronic and when you're coming um, northbound you only can see what we're proposing the uh, southbound facing electronic billboard and you cannot see the north facing existing electronic billboard again the geometry of the roadway you can't see both of them yes it's it's straight it's just the way it works out but they also want to I'm allow it in the cases where there are curvatures in the roadway or other you know that's how i was viewing that use of that word was geometry was curves in the roadway not yeah but but again it, it says can only view one sign 
at any, at any one point on the public way at any one time. And um, um, in this case, again, I was south, neither I was southbound facing or the existing north base. Um, you can only see one of them at any one time. Thanks. Kim, do you have any? I hear I hear what you're saying, but I'm not seeing that. To what you're talking about is two signs facing in opposite directions. Is not the geometry of the roadway. That's not how I'm interpreting that. I understand that you can't see through the static portion of the McDonald's billboard, if we want to call it the McDonald's billboard, to the electronic side, but that has nothing to do, I don't see that as the geometry of the roadway. Oh, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not fully, I'll be interested to hear what the rest of the board, have, um, you know, their it, questions. It would be interesting to note that I'm extremely confident the state has, well, first of all, I know they've done it before. Their main focus is to make sure that you can't see, and without an exemption, to make sure you can't see both faces. If you can't see both faces, there's not a public safety issue or anything like that. Um, so that's why they put the language in here. But it have, if they should deny it, they can't act before, obviously, the town does. Um, then it just remains a static and I you know but that's the only downfall I guess would be if they did say no but I wouldn't be sitting here before you if I thought they were gonna say no because I know what their intent is well first of all I helped write the CMR so I, I know what it's supposed to get after um, are they perfect no there's a lot of the CMR that's not perfect but in this instance the intent and I'm sure the town's intent also was, you know, not visual clutter. But an electronic billboard is offering so much more to the town than seeing just one static billboard that's less. But in this case, you're not even seeing two digital signs within a thousand feet. We're not asking for that exemption. And the, and the state still could reject it. And I think you'd, I, I wouldn't see where that would be it wouldn't be of any harm to the town, I guess, at that point. If they reject it, they reject it, and I'm wrong. And Mr. Splain is wrong. And, and again, they, they've stated it twice in the CMR. So, you know, my interpretation is, is that they were willing to allow the reduction. I mean, it, it seemed very odd to me that they, they said almost the exact same thing twice. They will allow the reduction of less than a thousand foot spacing requirement for uh, these reasons. And again, in the second one, they make it, you know, the first one says one visible from any point, the other one view one sign, but it says almost the same thing. So my interpretation and my understanding from the expert is if you, you can view um, both of those signs at any point on the roadway, it's a no. But if you can't view both electronic signs anywhere on the, on, on the highway together, then it's a yes. But I understand what you're saying too. Uh, Kurt, do you have any questions? Uh, I don't have any questions at this time. Okay, I, I don't have any questions either. I do have some things to talk about or to say, but I want to hold off on that. Um, is there anybody in the um, in town hall, any member of the public? And obviously there looks like there's nobody. Nobody, nobody wants zooming, to make a so comment, why don't no. we? I'm sorry? Nobody wants to make a comment, no. Okay, are there are people there? For the yes. next round. Okay. Um, why don't we close a motion to close the public portion of the hearing? Motion to close the public hearing. Second. Okay. Um, Kim? Yes. Lorraine? Yes. 
and me, yes. So let me just make a couple of my comments. Um, state regulations, 317.5G says electronic sh sign shall not be within a thousand feet of another off premise permitted electronic sign on the same side of the travel way, regardless of which direction the sign is intended to face. 317.5J says that subject to approval of the department, spacing between electronic signs may not apply where they are separated by a building or other obstruction, or the geometry of the roadway is such that only one sign is visible from any point on the public way at any one time. And 317.6 has very, very you know, similar wording. I read, I read um, 317.5J as I believe Kim is reading it, such that the only one sign being visible is tied into the, the other portion of that, of, of that paragraph. So in other words, a building or other obstruction or the geometry of the roadway has to make the, 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 the signs not being visible. Um, and, and not the fact that one is facing north and one is facing south. Now, notwithstanding the fact that the Office of Advertising, uh, the, the Outdoor Advertising Board rather, um, may in the past have read these paragraphs, these provisions, as Mr. McClary has indicated, I just want to point out that our sign bylaw says that no electronic billboard may be placed within a 1,000 foot radius of another electronic billboard. And here we do have the North Street billboard, portion of which is electronic. And if we were to allow, whether it's the south side or both sides of the billboard that Media Partners owns to be electronic, that would be within a 1,000 foot radius of the North Street electronic sign. So again, I think what is controlling here is not what the OAB may have decided in prior cases, but what our own sign bylaw does state. Mm -hmm. Comments for anybody else? I agree, Barney. I mean, we went in front of all the different boards, the committees, and talked about the thousand foot radius, mapped it out. You know, again, I, th I don't see that there's any ge geometry involved here, so. Um, I think the bylaw does not permit it. Uh, Kim? I agree with what you both have said. And Kurt? Uh, I agree with what you've said as well. Okay. And the other, the other thing that I would be you know, concerned about is, um, you know, creating a precedent here. I mean, we're always, according to get in the last matter, we're always concerned about precedent. And, and it would be a concern to me that if we were to, in, in a sense, you know, ignore the 1,000 foot radius requirement and, and grant what is being requested, uh, we're now creating a precedent that, um, you know, that, that, that may, may be, you know, to our detriment, you know, later on, um, you know, as Lorraine, you know, well knows when we initially three years ago, I guess it's three years ago now, we're proposing um, to amend the sign bylaw to allow electronic uh, signs, electronic billboards. Um, initially, um, Bill Kasbauer and I, on behalf of the Billboard Advisory Committee, met with the Board of Selectmen and indicated, again, the 1,000 foot radius would apply uh, then Lorraine and I met with the advisory committee and stated the same. Um, the billboard advisory committee prepared a report to town meeting 
in which we indicated that the that electronic billboards would be no less than a thousand feet you know apart and, and I stated that at um, at town meeting and I'd be concerned about you know in this case without some some compelling reason to um, um, to, to, to go against that, I would be concerned about creating a precedent that would be adverse to what we had reported and purported and um, stated and, and obviously approved at town meeting. So unless there's something else, do we need a motion? We do need a motion. Uh, I move that we decline the application. Second. Okay, again, I got to do this by roll call. So, um, uh, Kim? Yes. And Lorraine? Yes. And me? Yes. So, thank you very much. Um, Peter, maybe you can answer my question here today. In, in reviewing the OAB regulations, um, there are provisions relative to, to appeals. I, I was reading that as only referring to appeals from the decision of the OAB. You That's have correct. The right to appeal, you have the right to appeal our decision to the OAB? No, 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 no. The yours is to land court or superior court. Right. We're not going to do okay. that. So. Okay, that, that's how I read it. That's an administrative appeal through a administrative it's judge. It's an administrative law judge process. Yeah, right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Frank, don't go away or just come back. Diana, did you ever send minutes out? I sent minutes out. I did. I believe I did. Mm -hmm. I, I, did I? If, I don't if remember you did, seeing, I apologize. I, I don't have them. I don't remember seeing them. I wrote them. <laughs> did, do you have them with you that you can read them? Because we obviously didn't do very much. Um, I mean, it's no big deal if we wait until the next time. Okay. Let's see. I'm going to stay six Um... Frank, are you ready? Yes, thank you. Okay. Attorney Burr is with me. Hello. Good evening. What, why don't you start, Frank? What was that? Do you, you want to start or you want me to start? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'll, okay, I'm sorry. So, as the board recalls, at the last meeting, we talked um, after you know, our discussion with, um, with, with, with attorneys uh, Spillane and Burr about preparing a, an amendment to the uh, signed bylaw that would ultimately allow to have um, billboards along Interstate 95 and Interstate 495. And I prepared two scenarios initially. Uh, one is the one that I mailed out to you the other day, sent to you the other day by email, which would allow for, you know, billboards along the interstates by means of revising the um, signed district two uh, provisions in the um, in the signed bylaw. The other option that I that I drafted was to uh, create a um, an overlay district, and after discussing the the matter with um, with Frank and and discussing the matter with Bob, we determined that what you have in front of you is the better way to do it. In other words, to um, to, to make some revisions to the uh, to the um, district two um, provisions relative to uh, the signs. Um, you know, subsequent, we've made some, you know, small, you know, tweaks to it. And what you have in front of you essentially is a provision that would provide that billboards could be allowed 
in sign district two by means of a special sign permit um, on lots that are that have a lot line that is not on, on lots that are but interstate 95 or interstate 495 or on lots with a lot line that is not more than 250 feet from either interstate and that are situated within the town's limited industrial district and consistent with the current signed bylaw provisions no billboard may exceed 672 square feet in area um, we, we also are consistent with the um, current signed bylaw of creating the 500 foot radius for static signs and a thousand foot radius um, for electronic billboards um, consistent with the current bylaw billboards must be set back at least 10 feet from the lot line and then I've got a provision in here that no billboard may be placed within blank feet of an existing residential unit. Um, I haven't decided, even though Lorraine and I have talked about it, and Frank and I have talked about it, and Bob and I have talked about it as to what the appropriate um, distance may be. Um, I think what we're looking to do right now is to obviously answer any questions that other board members may have, and then ultimately to um, um, to um, make the rec recommendation to the board of selectmen that they consider placing this proposed bylaw on the uh, town warrant for um, consideration at the um, uh, May town meeting, the annual town meeting. Frank, you want to uh, jump in now? Uh, no, I think you summed it up quite well. Um, again, I think we need to determine what that uh, distance between the billboard and a residential unit is. Um, mm -hmm. Again, um, this all began when uh, Arthur Rounds on Springbrook Road um, was approached to put a billboard on his property. So we want to make sure that um, the distance um, is adequate for, for his property uh, from our perspective and again our preference is, is to work with this board the selectmen and any other board committee advisory planning board uh, to put this together so that whatever goes in front of the town meeting everyone is comfortable with if it passes um, but again if for example um, the board decides that they want, you know, I'm going to go crazy, 2,000 feet distance. We'll put our own citizens' petition together with the appropriate line. And I'm not using that as a threat. I'm just saying that, you know, we originally came here um, with the idea of trying to get the changes so that um, Mr. Rounds can put a uh, billboard on, on his property. And I use 2,000 because I know no one would use that number. Uh, but I think we can come up with a, a number that can be appropriate. You know, I know um, Attorney Burr has, you know, recommended 300. That's, you know, the length of a football field, uh, which is a good distance. Uh, and we'd be fine with that. Because, uh, again, our closest uh, um, residential unit on our side of 95 is over 1,000 feet away. But because there's a... Um, I believe it's a two family that abuts 95 on the other side of 95. That's actually our closest um, residential unit to where we would probably put the um, sign on Mr. Rounds's. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're within that area uh, to be able to do it. And, and that's approximately 500 feet. And I'm going to get that confirmed uh, with Bay Colony and Bill Buckley. Um, so I think we can do approximately 500 feet also I'd like to say is that you know this board was kind of designated by the Board of Selectmen to be the overseer of the sign by law so I, I think they may be looking for a recommendation also from you at some point and initially you know after my first draft um, you know what Lorraine asked me if I would have if what I was thinking about was was a thousand feet as far as the distance from you know, the closest uh, residential unit. And, you know, I think my rep 
flight to Lorraine was, you know, that that would be ideal. But if that's the case, we would never be able to place a a billboard on the uh, DPW property, mm-hmm. which um, at, at the very least is something that you know Bill Keegan, our town manager, has some some interest in. Um, I'm I'm not sure, you know, where on that property a billboard can be placed, and therefore I'm not sure, you know, how close any billboard would be to um, to any residential unit. Um, there, there are homes and there are apartments, as people know, on, on Elm Street. Uh, some of those, those homes are in the uh, limited industrial district. And, and there are homes on Central Street, which is fairly close to the, um, to, to the DPW garage. Um, you know, what, what I would, you know, hope is that if the Board of Selectmen have some interest in proceeding with this matter, that somebody would, um, you know, do some calculations and, and some determinations as to where a billboard could be placed on the DPW property. Then we, we would at least get a sense as to um, as to distance from residential units, and that would that would allow for us to, um, you know, to, to complete this um, this kind of proposal. But I, I think again at at this point in time, um, you know, my position is that. I would like us to recommend to the Board of, of Selectmen that they give consideration to placing this on the um, on the town warrant um, in, in May. Um, questions, comments, what have you? I, I agree, Barney, taking it to the board, let them decide, you know, if they want to spot, you know, support this, I would think, mm-hmm. you know, assuming that Bill Keegan is having some discussions with them about DPW opportunities, they should be able to figure out pretty quickly where they want to put it. I tried driving, you know, I drove by and was just looking at the different, not sure where they would want to put it because there are some houses right there, you know, by the railroad tracks and, you know. Football field seems like a reasonable amount. I just don't know if where that is in relationship to their property. Mm-hmm. So. Um, Kim, any questions or comments? Uh, no, I do like the idea of this going to um, the selectmen and letting them uh, take this and, and move it forward or not move it forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kurt? Uh, no, I agree with what Kim just said as well. Frank, would that be satisfactory to say that the consensus of our board was to to proceed? Yes, yes. Then, what, what I'd like to... Then try, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. What, what I'd like to recommend is, um, I've already talked to Bill Keegan about possibly going on the February 1st Board of Selectmen's meeting to bring this mm-hmm. forward at that time to discuss with them. And between now and then... Um, I'll also reach out to uh, uh, Bill Keegan about it. I think it would be good if one of the members also did um, to see if they can start looking at, you know, what they feel um, is needed for the distance from any residential um, units uh, with regard to that. Now, you know, my one concern is, again, if, if we do it as a citizen's petition, whatever we give them has to go on the warrant that mm-hmm. way. I would just want some assurances that if we don't do the um, citizen's petition and this goes forward, that a number that we're comfortable with will be placed there. Because mm-hmm. again, if they say a thousand feet, mm-hmm. we're not comfortable with that and we mm-hmm. just will do our own citizen's petition. Yeah. Um, now I think if they want to try to do something on the highway department, whatever number they come up with, we're going to be comfortable with. You know, the thousand feet. I think I'd have to go back and look at it. I don't think anybody could put um, any signs on it because of all the residences on the other side of ninety-five. Mm-hmm. You know, so that, that a thousand feet could be a you know a non-starter. So that, yeah. that has to be uh, looked at, uh, but also what would be required on the uh, DPW site. You know, that's really. The number that needs to be investigated. You know? Yeah, and and the location. You know, I really don't know the back of that mm-hmm. lot. 
there could be areas that they just can't put it and there could only be certain areas they can so that may have to be looked at too but I think we can you know work between now and then especially if they're willing to put it on yep. because if they're willing to put it on then this can be modified right up until you know the, the final closing of the warrant as it's open and closed and all that it can be open to you know change the language how it is if we put it in a citizen's petition it can't be changed you know I'd rather we'd rather work with everyone to try to get the best possible that goes in front of town meeting so that if it's approved you know we're as comfortable as we can uh, uh, with it and we very much appreciate all the help um, you know Barney and all the members have given us on this. It's, it's been a good process. Um, and uh, I was hoping it was going to work out this way, and I think it worked out great. I want to just thank you all. Okay. So can so anyone, we'll, um, I know, Barney, you're going to be away. Can anyone else go to the February 1st? Well, I, as, of, as of now, I'm away, but that unfortunately may be, may be changing. But um, I, I did speak with Lorraine, and she said that she would be able to to attend if, if if I can and even if I can uh, Lorraine hopefully you can join me then yep. okay thank you can I okay. just ask one question before we finish yep. with this so yep. we're saying we're saying that this is going to be our request is that this is sent to the Board of Selectmen for them to consider it mm -hmm. but we are not approving or disapproving of it we are right. just requesting that they take a look at this now yeah, at, right at, so it's not going point, over with zba approval yeah at, at this point in time um you know they, they may ask us later on and and we'll we'll obviously take up that request um but my position has been as i indicated you know in the past that this should come as a board of selectmen um proposal not a not a zba proposal mm -hmm. um because it, it really reflects a policy change to what we have in the bylaw right now um, and I did speak with Bill Keegan about it, and you know he expressed his agreement with that position. And, then, and then so, can even, so again, you know, the board of selectmen may may come back to us and say, okay, you know, come time for town meeting, we want to go ahead with this. We'd like a recommendation from the you know entity that deals with signed bylaws, and we'll yeah. we'll cross that bridge, you know, when and if it comes. Yeah. And they can even list it as Thank a you. citizen's petition or a citizen's request, since it's not technically a petition, but we're requesting that it be put on. So, you know, um, I don't think that'll be an issue. Um, and if it does become an issue, we'll just do a citizen's petition, you know, to get it on. But I think it's better if we all work together uh, mm -hmm. to get this move forward. And then people can take a look at it and decide whether they're in favor of it or not. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you for all the help on uh, the writing of it, too. You're welcome. Um, I just got a couple of sort of very short and quick announcements. Um, for the last, seems like forever, I've been saying that, you know, we may get a uh, 40B from the Moore Street property next month. We may get it next month. We may get it next month. Um, Diana contacted me earlier this week and indicated that based on information that Bill Buckley had provided, Number one, um, they still do not have the project eligibility letter. And after getting it, there's enough other things to do that um, it might be late spring, early summer before that, um, that application hits us. So, you know, I sort of feel like the boy who was crying wolf, but um, nothing is um, apparently going to be imminent on that one. Um, I do know from a discussion that I had last week with uh, Paige Duncan that the um, housing authority, which wants to construct a senior citizen housing complex that's basically on Wall Street right off of uh, 140, has begun the process as far as, um, as that particular matter. That also would ultimately end up as a comprehensive permit. Um, they have gotten two proposals in response to their to their RFP and I gather the housing authority is going to be um, to meeting with those two parties um, over the course of the say the next month to uh, before they finally make their decision um, long and the short of it is it's entirely possible that we'll have two comprehensive permits that in one respect or another will will overlap 
Um, when and if that happens, we'll figure out how, to, how best to deal with it. Um, second, um, I think as everybody, as I mentioned previously, uh, we have a new building commissioner and he'll be starting on Monday. Uh, his name is Scott Shippey. Um, you know, if you have a chance at some point in the next few weeks, just, you know, stop and introduce yourself uh, to him. Um, you know, I look forward to working with him and I'm sure he, and I know from what he had said during the interview, he looks forward to, um, to working with us. Um, third, and this has to do with billboards. Uh, three years ago, we approved a billboard on 124 Washington Street. And that approval, it, this was a static billboard. Uh, it was for, for Lamar advertising. That approval required the billboard to be placed 16 feet from the roadway. Uh, about a week and a half, two weeks ago, I started receiving emails from Paul DeBadges, who's the interim building commissioner, indicating that the billboard was not being placed consistent with our decision and consistent with the, um, the plans that we had, we had approved. And Diana has received from me copies of all the emails that Paul has been um, um, copying me on. Uh, the long and the short of it is I spoke with um, Bill Kasparo last week. Um, Bill has done some, you know, work with um, Lamar relative to the matter. And we came up with a potential resolution of the situation. But that resolution will require a, uh, a modification of our original decision. Um, that will probably be several months from now before it, um, before it hits us. And I think that is all that I have. Diana, anything else to bring to our attention? No. Um, I've had a few people inquire about filling out applications, but then I don't see them anymore. So I don't know if they're waiting for the new building commissioner or changing their minds or just waiting for the spring building um, thing <laughs> to start. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've had a couple of emails, one from Paul DeBadges yesterday relative to a potential sign application, and then one from uh, Gabby Jordan today, also relative to a different potential sign application. Hmm. Either one would be um, billboards, but both would, in one part or another, require a um, special sign permit. Um, that's all I've got, unless anybody else has any questions or comments or anything. Oh, I guess the one other thing is, and we can't talk about it because I don't want to go, we can't go into executive session tonight. Um, I think everybody is up to date on the, um, on the litigation, on the oil man litigation. Um, I think what I'll do is the next time we do have a meeting, I'll ask Pat Costello to come in and talk with us. Um, obviously, if anything else transpires in the next several weeks, I'll let everybody know. If anybody has any questions, you know, just give me a call. That is it. A motion to adjourn. So moved. I move we adjourn. A second? Second. Okay. Uh, Kim? Yes. Kurt? Yes. Lorraine? Yes. And me? Yes. Long meeting tonight. <laughs> good meeting tonight, I think. Definitely. Yeah, good decisions. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Feel better.